In the days before balloon angioplasty, there were really only two options for treating patients with coronary heart disease, and that was either bypass surgery or the use of medication, which in those days was extremely limited. When our fathers had heart attacks in the 1960s and 70s, you know, the, the chance of dad getting through that weren't that great. You know, we had 40% mortality rates back then. We used to call cardiologists, stethoscope cardiologists, where the physical examination was extremely important. But finally, in the 60s, what we started to do in my fellowship was to put catheters into the left side of the heart, photographing the coronary arteries for pictures that had never before been seen. The insight that it gave revolutionized cardiology. Lenox Hill actually had the first coronary care unit in the city in the uh, mid-60s. And it was a very fertile time in cardiology. Lenox Hill's catheterization laboratory, it was one of the first cath laboratories in the world. And then Dr. Sturzer came and carried it to even greater heights. We became pretty expert at coronary angiography. Eugene Walsh and I ran sort of a combined invasive cardiology, cardiac surgery service at Lenox Hill. Roy Kloss was a surgeon on the staff who was always interested in new forms of surgical therapy. And he showed me some animal data that Andreas Grunzig, then unknown, had shown to him when he was visiting the University of Zurich. Andreas Grunzig had done in an animal a balloon angioplasty using a balloon that he had made in his own kitchen, literally with polyvinyl chloride and crazy glue. And I said to Roy Kloss, where is this fellow? And he said, he's in my apartment on Fifth Avenue. I said, does he speak English? I said, if you can do this in humans, then this is gonna change the course of cardiology. I called him on the phone and I said, when are you gonna do your next case? Do you mind if I come? He said, no, I wish you would because there aren't too many people in the United States of America who have this long a track record doing selective coronary angiography. And I don't want this technology to die on the vine because of complications. I went to Mike Bruno, Nick DiPasquale, and David Reed, who at that time was the president of Lenox Hill. And they all said, if you really think this is worthwhile, go and see what it's all about. Without their permission, this never would have taken place at Lenox Hill. Many people said it could never, ever, ever work. How could anyone go in to that delicate structure called the coronary artery while the patient's alive and breathing and not under anesthesia. Stick some narrow catheter through it and then inflate this balloon. It was considered absolutely a sacrilegious concept. Many of the leading cardiologists of the day thought that uh, angioplasty was a, was a crazy, dangerous thing and didn't have any particular future. Well, I went to Switzerland seven times. I'd spend sessions with Grunzig as he was working on developing this with the most difficult, dangerous, primitive equipment that was all homemade. I remember when Andreas and Richard Myler and I were mulling over what to call this. We had a number of suggestions, but he liked angioplasty the best. He thought it was good in German, he thought it was good in English. I told him it would work in French, and that's how it started. It was after Andreas had done some 40 cases that he felt comfortable giving me material to take back to New York and start. You had a very large catheter. You had very limited supply of catheters. And to be able to use that catheter, you had to have perfect hands, like Dr. Sturzer. You needed someone who had the foresight and the courage to go over, learn this technique that was barely born, and bring it stateside. The first devices came into the United States without regulation. I took them out of their packages and I put them in my luggage in Zurich, in the airport, so that they didn't appear to the United States Customs of having much value. It took two or three uh, attempts before they got the equipment uh, smuggled in. <laughs> Our first angioplasty in the United States of America was done in the cath lab at Lenox Hill on March 1st, 1978. We didn't have any complications and the patient did very well. At the time, I thought it was a miracle. 
and it was such an exciting time. Suddenly, when we started doing angioplasties, the whole hospital knew where the cath lab was. These are what we think of as transformational events in medicine. And transformational events in medicine don't happen every day. In Time magazine, there was a picture of myself giving the first press conference at Lenox Hill. And I remember being quoted as saying that if this procedure lasts two years, it's a revolution in cardiology. So that was an understatement. As far as I'm concerned, the beginning of angioplasty may not have started at Lenox Hill Hospital if we did not have Dr. Gene Walsh's support and the surgical team who were awesome. You couldn't do an angioplasty for many years unless you had an operating room ready for an emergency. There were very few cardiac surgeons who were willing to do that. The collaboration between Dr. Sturzer and Dr. Walsh really foreshadowed 35 years later what we refer to as the heart team approach to the care of a, of a patient. Lenox Hill was ground zero in the United States for angioplasty. We were holding courses here for angiographers from all over the world to come and see how it is done. For five years, if somebody wanted an angioplasty, they came to Lenox Hill. The reason that we were successful is that we were as meticulous as you could be. We had some complications and some setbacks, but not enough to adversely affect the internal momentum of this procedure, which now is a standard operating procedure virtually all over the world. If research protocols had not been drafted, and if data had not been collected and analyzed coolly and critically and objectively, we wouldn't be here. We just wouldn't be here. The cases became progressively easy, progressively successful. It took about two or three years for enough of the establishment to be uh, impressed with the results to be doing it themselves. If I didn't do the first angioplasty in America, Richard Myler was right behind me and somebody else would have done it. I think, though, we accelerated the adoption of this very critical uh, part of therapy. As time went on and as the technology improved, the types of devices that were used were smaller, thinner, more flexible, much easier to steer. We learned how to apply the lessons of those development experiences to treat other diseases. We learned that we could do things inside the heart that we never dreamed were possible. The Lenox Hill Heart and Vascular Institute was developed as an integrated way of taking care of patients. The legacy of Simon Sturzer and the crew that worked with him reverberate through the halls here. The collaboration that I see between our surgeons, between our non-invasive personnel, between the electrophysiology crew, and the Interventional Catheterization Laboratory Physician Group. Never seen anything like it in my life. I owe Lenox Hill a lot because Lenox Hill gave me the opportunity to do something which in retrospect is a major contribution to American medicine, for which I think they should be proud. Interventional cardiology in this country began at Lenox Hill with Dr. Sturzer. We all recognize and acknowledge the enormous contribution that he has made to the field of cardiology. The essence of what he believed, that verve for doing the right thing, and for pushing the boundaries, for trying harder, for reaching to see if we can't do something better today for our patients than we were able to do yesterday. Uh, that is the summary philosophical statement of Lenox Hill Heart and Vascular Institute.